Hi, my name is Jasper. I'm a filmmaker, photographer, and a storyteller. Right after college, I spent most of my adult life as a nomad. For the past five years, I've been jumping from one country to another, telling stories of some of the most amazing people all over the world. Now, I've been traveling the world to the point that my life's belongings literally have been simplified to a suitcase and a backpack. Now imagine this, for the past years, I've been to 50 different countries, always on the go, one adventure after the other, and then the pandemic hit. My work, my life, like many of you, stopped. At one point, I thought my journey would still continue as usual, and so I hopped in a plane to the US where it had been multiple times. When I got there, I was denied entry for the first time. They sent me home. Now with no clear plans as to what I should do next or where should I go, I struggled with mental depression. Now the very thing that I thought defined who I was, what I thought my identity was, was taken away from me. So that's how everything started. With nothing to do, I was itching to do something, <laughs> anything, or go somewhere, anywhere. I was very thankful that I was given the opportunity to visit Palawan communities to take photographs. As I visited the communities, I remember my friend Daniel, a volunteer pilot. Now, years ago, I was also in Palawan filming him in his helicopter outreach as he did medical evacs and brought food, medicine, and mobile clinics to the jungles of Palawan. Now, I wasn't confident in my filming skills back then, so I promised him I would be back one day to tell his story. Literally told him, dude, I'll be back. So I planned to visit him and film his story for around five days. That five days ended up being seven months seven months in the beautiful mountains of Palawan. As I live with the Palawans, I listen to their stories. I realized that for many years that I've been doing outreach to different communities, I've been doing it from an ivory tower. Many times when we try to help people, we decide for ourselves what they need. We always think of things we can do for the community that we forget to do with the community. A friend once told me, we're used to giving a lot of food but have we really asked them if they're hungry? This changed my mindset radically. I've realized that the only way to truly help and make a positive impact in people's lives is to live with them and to listen to them, not as projects or as case studies, but as brothers and sisters. With a willingness to help, but without actually listening to the community, we initially to plan to just drop supplies, do a few, few feeding programs and giving out basic needs. But as I live with the locals and listen to them, their clamor was united and clear. We need schools. Education was a need they recognized, but they had very limited access to. To name a few challenges that could be potentially addressed Children in the jungles, especially the girls, get married as young as 10 years old. When they visit the lowlands, they're usually discriminated and stereotyped as stinky, dirty, and dumb. When they buy food in the markets, they're usually cheated by the vendors because they can't do basic math. The kids would tell me stories of how they would, don't want to go to school in the lowlands because of how they would be bullied, and that's heartbreaking. In my visit to different jungle villages, I came across Teacher Jillen, a young teacher who has dedicated her life to helping in the jungles. She started a makeshift jungle school, sometime teaching outdoors with Palawan's majestic mountains as her backdrop. When she was a child, Jillen was adopted by an American couple who also committed their lives to serving in the jungles. In effect, Jillen became an American citizen and could have chosen to live a more comfortable life in the U.S but Jillian chose to stay in the jungles and serve her own people. Growing up, Jillian was also abused. She told me how she can relate to the children because she's been through what most of them are going through. This is why she wanted to build a school, so they can have a safe place, a haven, where they can feel protected and where they can realize their self-worth and potential. Jillian really inspires me. She and her family chose to live in the remotest parts of Palawan with very little pay. That, to me, is what sacrifice means. So arm with my phone and my Instagram account and start to share stories about Pilot Daniel and Jillian and their work. I asked Jillian how we can help the community and she reached out asking if we can help with rice and blankets. So I posted this on my Instagram, which is a modest number, by the way, compared to popular social media influencers. 
I asked them if anyone can help me raise funds for a sack of rice and some blankets for Jillian. Now my followers were amazing. They outdid themselves and raised 250,000 pesos for the project. Now this blew my mind. I only had 10,000 followers at this time and to get that kind of response in a short amount of time was unbelievable. And so I went back to Jillian and brought her rice and blankets, not only for her, but for her whole community and to 14 different jungle villages around the area. We also have enough funds to bring in dentists, nurses, and doctors serving around 400 people and provided a month's stipend to seven volunteer teachers. All these made possible through the power of stories and social media. From here on, I realized how powerful social media could be and how it could be used to make a meaningful and lasting impact in people's lives. I know it can be done by an organization or who have a bigger platform with a significant amount of followers, but I never thought it would be possible with my humble Instagram account. Now, while in the jungles was presented with the option of getting a full-time nine to five job, I was offered to go to the US to do social media work for an organization. Now it became a real dilemma for me whether to take the job or to continue the work in the jungles. Now the idea of settling down in a first world country still somewhat related to do what I love with good pay was very inviting. I didn't know what to do, but I was reminded of what a friend of mine told me one time. He said, Jasper, if you want to know your calling, you ask yourself, what breaks your heart? More often than not, what breaks your heart is what you're called to do. That got me thinking, what breaks my heart? Is life really just about financial security? I looked around and, and my heart broke. What really broke my heart this time was seeing these children suffering from not having access to education, from walking hours and hours in steep, muddy terrains just to get to school, from being seen as objects to be given for dowry, from not being given opportunities, from being discriminated and mistreated. These things broke my heart. And so I decided to decline the job offer and keep on living in the jungles. But I still didn't know how to help. I knew something needed to be done, but I just didn't know what it was or how. So one time a jungle village invited us to come and they were asking if we could build them a jungle school. It was literally a tall order. I didn't even think it was possible, but I had to try. So I turned to the only thing I knew. I shared the stories through social media. I reached out to my followers and asked them if they could help me build what I called the Jungle School Project, a school 100% funded by social media. It sounded impossible at first, but I tried it anyway. So I posted daily updates. I highlighted food in the jungles, shared what it was like sleeping in a hammock under starry nights in the jungles. I showed how adorable the kids in the jungles are, as well as their daily struggles, just living life with the locals. I posted it all. From the epic adventures to the pain that our friends in the jungles are going through, all of it. And my followers responded. In just a few days, we've reached $10,000. And in a matter of weeks, we reached more than $20,000. This was apart from the fundraiser to fuel Daniel's helicopter, which was also $20,000. So the Jungle School project, which I initially thought was an impossible dream, was slowly turning into reality. The project wasn't without challenges. The village was so remote, it was so close to impossible to bring equipment in. Everything had to be airlifted. Carpenters that were willing to live in the jungles to build a school were also hard to find. Not to mention the teachers who would be actually teaching in the school and living with the community. You need to be radically crazy to agree to live in the jungles. So I met with a local organization called PAMAS and my pilot friend Daniel for support. The organization built three schools around the area already and used the Alternative Learning System or ALS from the Department of Education their work is truly inspiring. PAMAS also helped me with finding teachers who are willing to go and live there and carpenters who are willing to stay and finish the school. I want to give a shout out to two of our teachers and our carpenters who have dedicated their lives to helping the people. They are the real heroes. With the funds from social media and the support of the locals who helped carry gravel, 
wood, as well as clearing the area, we finished the school in just three months. We never expected it to be this fast considering the remoteness of the place. All of these activities from airlifting, roofing, transporting sacks of cement and other supplies are all documented in my Instagram for my followers to see. As we built the school, we learned that one of the struggles in the jungles is the harvest season. The kids help their parents in harvesting the crops for around two weeks and so usually, the kids who go to school in the lowlands will have to miss school for two weeks. Eventually, they would end up failing the school year. So we thought we need a school that will focus on the needs of the community. So instead of bringing kids to school, we bring school to the kids. Not changing the culture, but integrating into the culture itself. And so the jungle school began. We expected 30 to 40 kids, but over 100 kids enrolled, including a literacy class for parents every Friday. Now I know I can't cure all the problems here in the jungles, but I've always hoped to at least ease our indigenous friends' pain just a little bit. I want to let them know that they are heard, loved, and figured in. That they're not just projects, but a family. I realized that when you do what you love, duty becomes a delight and sacrifice a pleasure. It was not easy living in the jungles or sleeping in hammocks. <laughs> but I realized that when you love something, that it does not necessarily become easy. It's, it becomes easier, easier to do. And people will see that passion. People will see that and want to be part of it. This story is proof that people are drawn to empathy. And despite all the bad things happening, there's also no shortage of people that will restore your faith in humanity. The volunteers here are the best example of that. This was a tough journey, but I would do it again in a heartbeat. The work isn't over and the goal is to create more schools around the country. And guess what? We're on our way to building another jungle school in Palawan. So may this inspire you guys to meet people where they're at, not view them as projects, but as partners in creating and bringing positive change. The Jungle School Project has proved that when a community jointly recognizes an issue and co-identifies a solution, the only work left to do is to be a catalyst for change by amplifying voices, telling stories, and mobilizing resources. So my question for you guys today is, what breaks your heart? Maybe it's time to answer that and show up to answer that call.